Welcome to, are we beginning? To American Architecture Now. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest this evening is Edward Larrabee Barnes. Edward Larrabee Barnes is appreciated as much for his flexible, adaptable approach to design as he is for his practicality as an engineer. His most well-known buildings have ranged from the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, hailed as the best space for exhibiting contemporary art in the country, to the Haystack Mountain School in Deer Isle, Maine, which influenced a number of younger architects and helped fuel the shingle-style revival, to a Richardsonian polychrome church recently completed in Burlington, Vermont. Until this year, Mr. Barnes had never designed a new building for Manhattan. Well, he has certainly caught up in a hurry because he has three projects currently underway. And they are the IBM office tower, the Asia house, and the Klein building. A very warm welcome to you. The world of art concerns you almost as much as the world of architecture. And it has manifested itself in such diverse places as your designs for the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, the Scaife Gallery, which is in addition to the Carnegie Institute in Pittsburgh, the Marlboro Gallery in New York, the Wichita Art Museum in Kansas, the Fine Arts and Indian Museum in Santa Fe, the Fort Lauderdale Museum of the Arts in Florida, and the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts in Texas. There will be a gallery in the new IBM building, and of course, in Asia House as well. I can't think of anyone who has designed more spaces and places to exhibit works of art. Perhaps you could tell us how that all began. Well, the first job uh, <clears throat> we worked on was uh, the Walker Art Center, the first museum we'd done. Um, they asked me to, I don't think they would have picked me at that time since I hadn't done any museums, but the job was a rather small one. We were, we were simply uh, uh, adding a little bit onto the, their existing building. And I see Justin Lamb here who worked on that, and he will remember that after we'd worked on it for about a year, we advised them to tear the existing building down. <laughs> and then the job got to be a, 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 a big job. We not only had the wing, but we had the building. Turned out the original building was sitting on, uh, on uh, bad soil and was slumping, and it was impossible to add onto it and stop it from sinking. So uh, to their surprise, they found themselves working with an architect who had never done a museum before. And I must say, it was, it was a very, very happy experience. Uh, Martin Friedman, who is the director of that museum, is a, is a wild man. He, the museum is a, has a tiny permanent collection and has its policy is to have very exciting visiting shows, very experimental shows. It, uh, uh, farther out, I would say, than anything that, uh, that you see typically at the Museum of Modern Art. It's, it's ex exactly on the fringe of what's going on. So he was open to uh, uh, all kinds of ideas in the architecture. And uh, I, th I think that it was an absolute honeymoon for uh, four or five years working on that building. Well, what was your chief consideration in designing that space? Well, the, the problem in, in museums, I feel, is to uh, focus on the art and on the people going through the museum and not too much on uh, doing an architectural monument. The uh, problem with many museums is that the architect uh, uh, upstages the art. And uh, since the, I was dedicated to this whole idea of, of uh, anonymous uh, white spaces to show art, which is exactly what Martin Friedman wanted, and I thought it was marvelous, the question was how to arrange these so that the very galleries themselves could, be, could become the processional space. Um, I mean, usually you think of museums like the Metropolitan Museum with an enormous uh, Grand Central Station Hall with no art in it, and a uh, sort of a statement of pomp and circumstance, and then you go to galleries beyond that. In the case of the Walker, you are immediately caught up into a, uh, uh, a succession of white rooms which go up like a spiral staircase to the top of the building where there is a, a sculpture garden. And uh, the, uh, it's, the idea was to get people involved immediately with the, with the 
that whatever storyline they were they were, they had that day, whatever they were showing, immediately, no fooling around. When you got in that building, you immediately were, were caught up in it and thinking of the art. It's an and, idea uh, that most artists are certainly not accustomed to. You describe an anonymous space <laughs> where the art where the architecture takes a back seat, so to speak, to the art. How did artists respond to that museum? Well, <clears throat> I, uh, I come back to that question of taking a back seat, but the, uh, the artists liked it. They, were, they were really were uh, very, very nice about it after the opening and since then, and I have a lot of letters from artists and so on, good, nice letters about it. I think the question is, does a, does a building of that kind uh, can that be strong architecture? Uh, can it also be positive architecture? Uh, and I feel very definitely that the, that the proportions of the room, that the rooms themselves have to represent calm, well-proportioned spaces and the sequence must work. And the uh, sense of flow, the way you move through it and all of this must be graceful. And I don't see, I think it's a very difficult thing to explain uh, how you can do architecture with a strong central idea, just as, just as self-centered an idea as any building, and at the same time have that idea apt for um, this, um, uh, its, its function of uh, bringing out the, these various shows which go through it. Um, it's not just an anonymous building. I think that's what I want to say. <laughs> you referred both to the processional space and the sequence. I presume you mean both the passage through the architectural space and chronologically through the exhibits. Does the layout of these museums and the galleries have anything structurally in common? I'm not sure I understand. You mean the the uh, the, the the layout of the of the show of the show and no, the of the space itself, because the museums are obviously all different, particularly oh, in see. terms of of their location and their collection. Yes. But is there any unifying principle? Well, uh, there are differences, and and, and I think that uh, I could describe another museum to uh, show you the difference and show you what's the same. Uh, the Indian Museum that we're working on in Santa Fe is another museum which involves flow, how you move through the museum, how you see all of, all, everything, and it also involves uh, space, but it doesn't look a bit like Walker. And I have to take 30 seconds to describe it to you. The Indian Museum in Santa Fe is a museum for Pueblo art and for Navajo art. And um, I worked with Alfonso Ortiz, who was a, 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 an Indian, um, and a, 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 a scholar, and a, also a Red Power Indian, a very interesting combination, and an esthete. And he uh, explained to me that the Pueblos were introverted, uh, inward-looking, peaceful people, stable, agrarian, who stayed in the same place forever, and that they were uh, absolutely marvelous uh, farming culture. A happy family culture, and that the the Navajos were a roving, nomadic, um, ricocheting society who went from uh, Mexico to uh, New Mexico and back to Mexico again, and had gone through periods of complete um, suppression and then risen from that and appeared in another place, and end up today drinking too much and driving pickup trucks, many of them, not all. Totally different kind of a culture, and a culture which was not timeless, but, but, but uh, had to be told chronologically, because after the purge in Mexico, they came out and did silver, which they hadn't done before, and the blankets all of a sudden began to have a frame around them, somehow representing a, a wall around things. And there are a number of things that happened to them in their uh, uh, travels over the centuries, which are, you have to take it chronologically to understand the art. Whereas the Pueblos, really, if you go back to um, archaeological times, the, the ancient monuments are very like the current monuments, and it really doesn't make much difference. The time sequence isn't that important. It's timeless. So the concept was to have a kiva-like round room in the middle um, with a series of ramps and things in it so that you, this was the Pueblo show. And that around that, a rectangular room, so you had a circle in a square, 
and the spaces in the rectangular room, you were continually confronting curved walls and being pushed against rectangular walls and back and going around and pinched spaces uh, and opening out. And these, um, the symbolism of the pinched space and the, and the exile uh, was perfectly clear in the way the, the, the show is arranged. And the, um, it is possible to uh, uh, enter that building and to go around chronologically through the Pueblo and then to enter the, uh, uh, through the Navajo and then to enter this single room uh, and have a sort of a single experience, which is the Pueblo art. Now, the whole bus too long, but the point is that that could only be for those two cultures and those two uh, functions, and yet the spaces and the, and the sense of flow uh, are just as much a concern as they were in the walker. One of the things that is of considerable concern to you in museums is the use of natural light. Is that the best way to view art, and how do you accomplish that in a formal museum setting? <clears throat> well, I think that's a <clears throat> controversial question in the museum world. The conservationists uh, today say that you have to show prints and drawings and watercolors in about five foot candles, five to ten foot candles, and uh, paintings you can go up to 50 foot candles. And that would mean if you were really putting on a good show where those things have to be shown together, that you're puzzled about how to put them in the same room. And for some artists, like Paul Clay, it's almost impossible to think of a, of a Paul Clay show without the, dr the uh, drawings and the paintings close by to have parallel ideas. So the idea that a uh, building has daylight makes problems for certain, certain kinds of shows. So if you do a building that has daylight, you have to be able to close it out off and turn it not only for night shows, but also turn it off entirely if you have vulnerable works. But having said that, I think that the, um, any layman, anybody who likes paintings in their house or any other place would, would rather see paintings in daylight, the way they were painted, and would like to even see them in changing light, and um, light which uh, is not always north light, that sometimes is warm and sometimes is cool. The Dallas Museum, we're going beyond the uh, kind of top light that we have in, uh, in, in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, and we are building in courtyards. Um, Seven continuous courtyards. Continuous courtyards, so that you see the paintings with uh, nature. And in the case of uh, the Monet collection, that nature, co that courtyard, we think will have water lilies and uh, willows and uh, wisteria and that kind of uh, flickering light. And the, the, the association between certain kinds of light and certain kinds of flickering uh, elusive light and the paintings, we hope will be clear. Um, to do that, you have to have a lot of uh, talk with the conservationists about how to shade when the sun comes in and all that. But if it comes off, it will be a, um, an unusual museum that the light is coming in sometimes from above and sometimes from the side. and. Uh, uh, and continually changing. While we are on the subject of art museums, why don't we extend that a bit and talk about the relationship between art and architecture today. How do you see that relationship currently and what do you think should be the future of that collaboration? <clears throat> well, I think that's an awfully interesting question because when you say that, to historians, they immediately think of the Middle Ages or Greece, and they, you think of, a, of a, a, an art form which is which extends, uh, where there's a continuous uh, uh, a, a range of thought from the architectural space to the to the uh, sculptural detail, and there seems to be no clashing of gears or conflicting points of view or will or anything like that. We are living in a in a period of protest and uh, not in the Middle Ages. And while some of the art today is complacent, much of it is, if you think about it, the commentary on the transient quality of society, on the, on the absurdities of society, on the existential quality of society. And therefore, it doesn't add up on purpose. So that if you're, if you so often happens that if you're an architect and you're asked to work with a sensitive sculptor, that he will feel his mission is to cut across the grain and not reinforce it. Um, I, the, the best example I have of this is a, uh, uh, the same Walker Art Gallery, where 
for that, for this wonderful sculpture deck on top with a view of Minneapolis and a special promontory where we wanted the best piece of sculpture, Martin Friedman said, we're going to have Richard Serra, the sculptor, come and do a, a major piece here. I was delighted. Serra was, uh, was a, a, a very powerful protest type sculptor. And so we had a meeting in our office and discussed this, uh, this promontory where the art was to go. Sarah went away, came back in two weeks, and he said, I've got it. I know what I'm going to do. He said, and then he began to get tense, and, he, and his lip began to twist, and his teeth came down, it seemed to me. And he said, I'm going to have a 40-foot long billet of steel, eight feet high and eight inches thick, rusty, shipped to Minneapolis and we will have a crane standing next to this building and we will swing it for two hours and then we will smash that into the elevator tower and the bricks will fall out and the sheetrock will fall out and the concrete blocks will fall out and my sculpture will stick into the building and that's my sculpture and uh, Martin Friedman said well Ed I think that's a good idea what do you think of that? <laughs> And how did you reply? <laughs> well, I knew him well enough not to die, but uh, <laughs> we decided not to do that quite that way. <laughs> but the, um, uh, <clears throat> some of, uh, of the uh, sculpture, uh, uh, I'm working now with Larry Bell on a, on a piece. This is for the new IBM for the building. IBM building. And uh, the IBM building is, I suppose if you simplified it down, you would say it was sort of a, uh, a prismatic form, a uh, simple pr prismatic form, a little bit like Donald Judd sculpture or something of that kind. And essentially, um, uh, I like Bell very much because he's, he has these simple, simple uh, volumetric glasses. Does everybody know what Larry Bell's things are like? They're, they're often glass cubes, uh, and the glass is tinted and changes, uh, sometimes slightly mirrored. And um, so you, while the form itself is extremely uh, 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 sim simple uh, and prime, the, the actual surfaces are, are never quite where you think they are. And uh, in this case, I think that, uh, that, that his work will be sympathetic to the building, very sympathetic and not a protest. And he's <coughs> working with a, with, on, on a fountain, glass and water fountain, which uh, uh, I think would be uh, it, it reinforce the idea of the building. Do you actively seek collaboration in your <clears> building? <throat> um, yes, but I haven't had enough of that experience, and I know you're you're very interested in it. And I think there should, there is going to be more with the uh, current trend in architecture. I think you can you can um, see more and more experiment <clears throat> experimentation. Um, it's it. Too much of, of the uh, 50s were spent simply doing a plaza and putting uh, Henry Moore in just the right place in the plaza, which is a little bit like putting a monogram on a shirt. It really isn't what I call involvement between the sculpture and the architecture. I mean, to have the sculpture and the architecture really involved with each other, <clears throat> you either have to have the facade of a cathedral or you have to have the Sarah thing sticking into a building, but you have to get together. And, the, and I think that the kind of sanitary relationship which we w went through the 50s and 60s is over. And in the profession, there's all kinds of talk about uh, illusionistic effects by painters mixed with architecture. And um, so I think it's going to be a very exciting uh, decade, the 80s, in that regard. You once said that you viewed your art in your education, architecture was some sort of sculpture. Do you still hold that view? Yeah. Um, she, I'm sorry, what was the question? She wanted to hear, 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 couldn't hear you. I will, and may I ask you please to come a little bit more close <coughs> to the front as well. I said, what did I say? <laughs> what was the question? Um, the question oh, well, in your sculpture. education, you said that uh, you referred to architecture as sculpture, and I asked you, do you still hold that view? <clears throat> yes, I think that some of architecture is sculpture. <clears throat> I mean, the other parts, things that architecture is that sculpture isn't. It is a, uh, uh, you know, a social instrument. I mean, it, it's uh, connected with history and society and, and structure and all kinds of things that uh, 
uh, with te technology, and there are many things where architecture is rooted in society and, and technology that you don't see in sculpture. Um, but there's a side of, uh, of architecture which is absolutely pure sculpture, should be. Uh, Georgie Kepish was quoted last week as having said that uh, much of the public art that is sprinkling the countryside resembles knickknacks on the Victorian mantelpiece. <laughs> is that a view that you would share? Yes, I think that uh, there is a lot of public art which is just junk. And, uh, <clears throat> but in fairness, a lot of it is due to the background. I mean, it, there are two ways of looking at that. One is to look at the art, and then if you do put yourself in the, in the point of view of the young artist who got the commission to do a Cortin clay sculpture or something in a main square, and look at the main square, it is not St. Mark's you're putting it in. It is usually a parking lot of some sort, or, or seen against park, no parking signs. And um, the uh, setting is almost impossible, uh, the city setting for so many of these things, that it's unfair to blame it all on the sculpture. But either way, there's a lot of it that's not successful. Before we talk about the three buildings specifically that you are building in New York City, Perhaps we should say something now that we've commented on the state of art about the state of building in the city of New York these days. Can one architect really have much effect on the cityscape? Uh, well, I think that's difficult. <laughs> I think in the, ca in the case of Chicago, where I came from, you'd have to say that the Chicago school, and Chicago has much more personality than New York in the terms of a city with a character uh, architecturally. Uh, I suppose there are many things. The fact that there was a Germanic uh, background at, uh, to Chicago, many Germans settling there. The fact that uh, the, uh, the, it came at the moment when the steel frame was just developing, and yet uh, Sullivan had a tremendous influence. But if you see him in the pattern of Chicago, it, uh, he's only one thing. Uh, there was Richardson did some building out there, and other buildings. It's not he, he's a huge, but he isn't dominant. And so in New York, the question is, can, does one architect, is one architect dominating should one the architect. scene? Or should one <laughs> architect? And I think in the case of New York, there is nothing, there's no sort of spirit the way there was in Chicago, the common spirit about structure and, and, uh, and clean structure. What there is in New York is a, are the New York zoning laws, which uh, are designing a lot of buildings. And uh, I, the, uh, I think we, we all know that those have come in waves, the setback building, the building that goes straight up, the building back of a plaza. And uh, the educated eye can uh, spot zoning ordinances uh, more, easy than more easier than architects. How much of a building is designed by zoning laws and how much is designed by architects? An awful lot is designed by uh, zoning. We, for example, on the Klein, building that you, George Klein is a commercial developer. And um, when you work on a building like that, your first uh, month is uh, computing every inch of rentable space that you're allowed to put on a lot. And uh, what uh, bonuses you're going to give the city in terms of parks and, and uh, the, what amenities you can give the city to be allowed to build more floors. Uh, the setback, uh, the, the uh, uh, how, just exact relation to the street and all of these things are very tightly controlled. To produce out of that a building with uh, good proportion and uh, a sense of form is very, very difficult. I think we'll discuss that more specifically in terms of some of the buildings. Yeah. What do you see now as the major challenges, and that is aesthetically speaking, to building in New York City? Aesthetically speaking, uh, I suppose the, uh, it's, it's an extension of this. It's the building-to-building -building relationship, which is, it seems to me is where it's at. Um, you, th there was a time when, uh, when architects just simply thought each one felt, I'll make a plaza or what vestige I can make of a plaza and put a building in the middle of it, and it really doesn't make a difference what's next to it. And the sense of um, context that you now have uh, growing, and particularly in New York City, because of this compaction of all the buildings, the awareness of what's next to it is so terrific. 
It happens to be what's going on in the schools. When I was in architectural school, you were given ideal problems, uh, isolated problems, uh, a satellite town to design just off in pretty farmland or a single building or a house on top of a hill. Almost all the problems at the Harvard Architectural School that I, when I went around and looked at them all, were, are called contextual problems. There's Currently. hardly ever now in architectural that they're not giving students buildings between a Gothic church and a gas station or, or uh, crowded or uh, in between other buildings or mixed in, into a transportation network or something. And um, that, of course, is already going on in the, in the, in the uh, profession by and people like myself who weren't educated that way but found out that it was important. And when this new wave of architects come out of the, all the architectural schools with a sense of context and caring about it, it seems to me that, that the cities are going to have a, um, a, a look, I don't know, have the, have the concerns that you see in a place like Florence, where it was perfectly clear that, that one palazzo knew what the next palazzo was doing and that there was some sense of continuity, even with changing styles. Um, so there I see tremendous uh, hope for the city, that it, that it won't look like a number of disparate things, uh, isolated, lonely, but will be knit. You once said that the most exciting thing about New York is its wonderful gridiron of streets. And that gives everything form and permits privacy as well, uh, variety as well. It is, you went on to say, it is a graph paper against which all goods are displayed and is a foil that saves New York. And as such, the street lines must be reinforced. Why don't we get back to the IBM building now and why don't you tell us how that relates to the gridiron of the city? Well, the IBM building um, is on the corner, uh, being built now, on the corner of 57th and Madison and 56. It's half of that block. And there, it was a large enough block by building, by zoning, we had to leave 40% of that open and we could build on the other 60, uh, the, uh, the, the other way around, 60% open and 40% we could build on. Um, only 40% of that could have a tower. The rest had to be low, no, long, no more than uh, 65 feet or 70 feet high. And we had a choice about where to put the tower and where to put the open space. And um, as, as I think many know that the Seagram's building set a pattern which was imitated up and down 6th Avenue of setting the building back and not on the street line. The Seagram's uh, is an exception on Park Avenue. It makes a lovely space framed by other buildings set forward that same pattern of setting the building back uh, 75 feet or 80 feet or 100 feet from the street is what you see along 6th Avenue. And um, after that had been built, the, the, uh, all architects and right thinkers began to question whether the street was uh, existed anymore. It was an amorphous space, and when you walked on the street, you were uh, a long way off from stores or anything that was going on in the buildings. So. Uh, not just myself, but a number of architects began to feel that even very big buildings which would cast shadow were better set right on the street, with the shops right on the street. Um, the uh, Holly White, who has written about uh, 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 the way people move and sit down and, and uh, pedestrian life in a city, uh, reinforces this, that the uh, no matter how, uh, the worst thing you can do for retail and for the ambiance and excitement of a city sidewalk is to break the street line, which puts the space, leftover space, in back, in the mid-block. So our IBM building is set hard up to the corner of 57th and Madison. Uh, and the, what action there is in the ground floor, uh, exhibition center and, and uh, retail space, will be right on the street, reinforcing the other, other shops. If you go down the street, you can look at shop windows and not find something 100 feet away, missing teeth, and that kind of thing. But and it throws the open space arcade, into the mid-block. But hmm? doesn't your arcade, uh, isn't that within the uh, building itself, the pedestrian arcade? Yes, the pedestrian arcade, in this case, is a covered plaza, a glass-covered plaza. Um, and, it follows that if you put the tower, 40% of the building, uh, right on the street, that there must be 60% in back. And that 60% in this case is a greenhouse structure, uh, which uh, is a, uh, uh, really a covered plaza. And, you, and it's used as a, as a through pedestrian walk between 
57th and 56th. Why don't I take a moment and describe what the building looks like, and will you correct me if I am wrong, please? Uh, to begin with, it rejects the glass box design that fills most of the city. It is a five-sided, 603-foot-high, 41-story, gray-green, polished granite tower that has a prismatic shape. Perhaps you would tell us what the, centra, the, what the central theme of the whole design is and how you arrived at the prism shape. Well, I think the, um, uh, the it seemed to me that uh, a, 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 what was bound to be a, a very big building and breaking the, uh, the uh, skyline in the new part of the city uh, where everything else in that immediate block was low, that um, we didn't want to build a blockbuster. That is a simply uh, big square building, uh, symmetrical in every direction and very dominant building. And that we, there might be a way to do a building which would uh, uh, be broken up into odd-sized planes, uh, uh, odd shapes. Uh, one end of the building, for example, is very narrow. It's only 50 feet, and it goes up uh, over, over, as you say, 600. And uh, another is a big, broad plane facing southwest. Uh, and the two on the streets are, are plain, rectangular planes. As you walk around the building, it, it will appear different in different lights on different sizes. Uh, and and never, uh, it, you never will quite realize what the form of the building is, I hope. That was the intent of that the design. That was the intent, yeah. So that from every angle, in a sense, you would see a different a building. Different, a different building, And yes. buildings that, again, concerned itself with the context that the new building was in which it was placed. Yes, the, the, uh, the uh, scale of the 50-foot width, when you, see, when you see that, a narrow a shaft going up and don't see the rest of the building, will be very dramatic, very much like the old buildings that were built, the Woolworth building and that kind of thing, that kind of slender, steep proportion. You pointed out to us that tower block buildings that are sighted back from the sidewalk and fronted by large plazas has finally been abandoned. And your building, of course, demonstrates a different solution to the desire for public space within the building site. You have some neighbors that have used a different solution. Since you were the first fellow on the block, how do you feel about their solutions and how uh, they have concerned themselves with context. Well, I think the um, uh, the AT and T building um, is uh, too bulky. Well, why and don't you it, compare how much of the lot you were using to your neighbors? Well, it, the AT and T building is covering, um, if I'm right about this, a little less than sixty percent of the lot with their tower delivering back to the city a little less than 40 percent of, of this um, open sky, <coughs> which is reverses what we're doing. Um, we are building a tower which covers 40 percent and delivering back 60. Um, now, no one sees that. Uh, in, in the city, nobody knows who owns the open space between the buildings. But nevertheless, there is a responsibility of um, it seems to me, to follow the law, which is no, the tower should be no bigger than 40%. And I, I think at the time the AT&T building was built that this, the, um, the AT&T simply was talking of going to New Jersey if they weren't allowed to build that much bulk into the tower. And that was when New York was flat on its back. And I think it's a decision that they wouldn't make today to allow that much coverage, it's called, of, of an individual lot. So that um, my chief objection to that building, and in fact, my only objection, is the bulk, the exaggerated height and the exaggerated coverage, which um, it seems to me will, it will, it needs a much larger site. It should be at the end of Park Avenue or something. The, um, the, the capricious top uh, I think it's fine. I think that architects should have fun, and that's fine. Uh, you see architecture as visual sight gag? Well, I, I, the, the top is anybody can comment on the top, whether, whether, whether you like it or not. I think it's fun to have that kind of thing going on in the city and variety. But then a building, as I've said, has to look, look well in moonlight. Um, it has to, has to be um, uh, 
someone said, said, what's so wonderful about a colonial house and a farm and a barn and so on? And, and they say, is it the fan window with all the little uh, detail or is it the green shutters or what is it? But actually what's wonderful about those buildings is the, is the massing of the silo and the barn and the, and the, and the actual square of the house. And uh, that's what you see uh, in moonlight. And uh, in terms of, uh, uh, to me as a designer, in the hierarchy of the things in a building, the, the volume, the massing the, uh, is the most basic thing. And if you're not right on that, you might as well not fuss with the fan, fan window. Uh, and I think that's extremely important and very, very difficult in, within the current zoning to have even enough elbow room to get a good proportion. In a telling article in Progressive Architecture, Suzanne Stevens writes about the public amenities in your building, in the AT&T building, in the Der Scott Bonwood yes. Teller Trump building, whatever yes. it will ultimately be called, and says that it is beyond dispute that the quality of the amenity, uh, amenities, <laughs> <laughs> thinking of your greenhouse, <laughs> of the amenities uh, are superb. But she goes on to point out that what these three buildings and many other buildings in the city now add up to is the interiorization and what she calls the privatization of what is generally referred to as bonusable public space. And she contrasts that interiorization with the street life and the activity on all of Madison Avenue. Do you share um, that concern? Well, all of these bonus public spaces had to be kept open till midnight. Um, so I don't think they're private. That is the space under the AT&T building, under their arcade, and the space in our greenhouse and the our, our arcade. And I think the space in Der Scott's building, even though it is really entirely interior space that you can't see into, has to be kept, kept open till midnight. And the theory is that, um, that a city the, the city planner's theory is that these space, that that's part of the city, these inside spaces, a little bit like Minneapolis. They think there that all these bridges are just as much a part of, a, of a recognizable public space as the sidewalks. Uh, so I don't, don't agree with Suzanne Stevens on that. I think the, uh, that the quality of uh, uh, pedestrian movement in, that, in those two blocks is going to be extremely interesting. Uh, whether it's all going to add up, I'm not sure. But I think it's going to be very, very lively and very, very exciting and very various. As we've mentioned, IBM is next door to Philip Johnson and John Berge's AT&T Tower. And on the other side to the immense new glass tower that is going up on the former Bonwit Teller site, which is just around mm -hmm. the corner from IBM. Um, can you tell us how you try to how you did try to relate to your neighbors, how they have tried to relate to you. Is that possible? And are you disturbed? Are you pleased? Are you concerned with the results? <clears throat> Our building started first. So we, um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I did though um, call on uh, uh, Houghton at, at uh, Corning Glass and I made contact with Bonwit and worked with Janesco who owned Bonwit Teller and um, tried to organize what you might call a block party on 56th Street uh, because uh, we were in the process of designing and we wanted to, we, there was a hotel group that was gonna build on the current AT&T site and I met with them and we discussed massing and, and all kinds of things. And, uh, but then, uh, for better or for worse, we made the first assumption and went ahead. Uh, after that, the, other, the others had the responsibility to, to check with us. They had a reference point. And I think um, uh, within limits, the pedestrian flow has been checked through. There are some things that we all agree could be done better. But there is an arcade in the AT&T building, uh, not too far off from lining up with our uh, arcade. And there is another arcade going through Bonwitz, which will ha lead this pedestrian flow all the way to Fifth. Um, I think the... Um, uh, and Der Scott came to me when he was designing his building and, uh, and worked very hard to, sh to form his mass as a foil to ours. So I, I think that there has been uh, some, some, there'll be much success at the pedestrian level. 
the relationship between those three towers, when you get all through, is going to be very odd. And, uh, uh, and I think uh, we have a model in the office which shows them all, and it is really uh, uh, three disparate towers, uh, all of a sudden growing like mushrooms in the night, over 600 feet high, almost twice as high as the adjacent buildings, uh, looking totally different. And it, I, I think it's going to be exciting. I think it's going to be provocative. I think it's going to be, represent this transient quality of life that I'm talking about. Will it be good? But the question is, it, would you say it was absolutely a calm, serene space? I don't think so. I think that... Uh, what does all of the glass in the Durascott building do to your and Philip Johnson's efforts to bring granite back? And what do you think of the color of that glass? When last I heard it was bronze. Yes, I, I hope it dis doesn't remain bronze. I think that the <coughs> brown color to me is uh, it, it's just personal. I, do, I would prefer to see it a uh, silvery green or something more like the, the UN Hotel uh, that Kevin Roach did. Have I mean, you there are the most wonderful. That to the architect? Hmm? Have you communicated that to the architect? I've told him, but there are architects, and he's not the only one who like brown. And there's a lot of brown. There are a lot of brown buildings in all over the country. So I decided he really does like brown, <laughs> and I've had the courage to tell him too. <laughs> Um, you've talked about your interest in education and what you foresee happening in the future. And for good reason you have a right to do so. Because for a very long while your office has been very much a breeding ground for creative younger architects. They've included people like Jack Robertson and Robert Siegel and Charles Gwathme. Can you hazard a guess as to why this has happened. Is there a particular kind of environment that you've sought to create? Now, I find it <coughs> uh, difficult to guess. I think that uh, one thing that has happened is that uh, I've been lucky to get part very good people who are to come and work and at the same time have not wanted to indefinitely expand. If you uh, have a uh, uh, office and just continually expand if you can get, get the jobs and there have been times when I could uh, then there's a future for everybody in the office and uh, t there's always a, a brighter future ahead if there are more jobs more people more jobs more people if whether the quality holds up is something that worried me and whether my own lifestyle would hold up or my own nerves or it would hold up is worried me too so Somewhere along about the middle, I had concluded that the, the office of uh, over 50 was a, beginning to be a problem. Uh, office of 100 is a different structure. So there has been kind of a ceiling, and with very, very talented people in the office, uh, it, the, the, and without the option of, of being in a continually expanding office, uh, I think that uh, the, the number of bright guys have been forced out to swim on their own and uh, they've been very successful. And I've tried to encourage them and help them. The, uh, it's happens. a different kind of office. I think if, you, if your organization inclined, uh, it's fun to build a huge organization that's structured like General Motors or something. But I don't have any interest in that at all. So there's kind of a self-limit to the whole thing. And definitely, uh, uh, at a certain point, a number of young people, I see some here, uh, have to think about their own careers. Do you find that younger architects are more, are more or less interested in going out into their own practice? And what advice would you give to a younger architect? Well, I feel that there's some things that you always wonder why you didn't do. And uh, if there's any chance of that happening to a, to a young architect, I hope that, uh, that the people that are here in my office won't all leave tomorrow, you understand. <laughs> but I think that, um, speaking as a friend and not as an employer, I think that it's very, very important to, so, to uh, uh, if you have that in you if, you, if you, if you, if you're going to feel, why didn't I do it ever, then for goodness sakes, make the move. If you like to work in a team, and if you feel that uh, an office such as mine is loose enough so that there's fulfillment as a designer and, and all of that kind of thing, then I think it's probably reasonably satisfactory. But the, the um, business of finding out about yourself um, in, in somebody else's office 
In all honesty, I think it's—I think you—you you never know until you till you're thrown on your own and you have to make decisions and so on. It, it not not in quite the same way. Um, that's not a prepared statement, but I think it's, I'm trying to be honest. <laughs> we appreciate that. It's been said. In fact, it is, I guess, accurate to say that you really don't have what is referred to as a quote style. Your work has never fit quite into the mold of either orthodox modernism, and yet it hardly belongs in the category of the new postmodernists. Would you comment on this, and how would you describe your style? To, and do you feel that you do have a style? I, I suppose I do think that I have a uh, uh, style, which uh, when I went to school, there were words that were like uh, clean. It was, a, it was a word that was used in architectural circles, uh, a clean designer. And um, nowadays, that word is out, and there are all kinds of other words that are, that are used, uh, metaphor, symbolism, this kind of thing. But the, the idea of being a, a simple uh, uh, and uh, clear-headed, doing work which has clarity, has always appealed to me tremendously. Happens, however, that, I, that we've had an, uh, a, all kinds of projects of college jobs, schools, banks, uh, office buildings, museums, theaters. And um, if you really do a functional building, you, they all come out looking quite different. Um, but I, I like to think that at the base of each of these designs, there's some sort of a clarity of thought. And uh, if you are working with people in the office and you are not interested in, in uh, completely uh, dominating every facet, it um, is essential that the basic schematic idea is, uh, is uh, clear. And if it is clear, then you have a kind of an armature that people can work within or around. How can you design in so many different styles? It's extraordinary. Uh, I don't think the st there are that many styles. There are different materials. I think that the um, haystack, for example, is great interested in volumetric form, as Walker is and IBM is. Um, uh, but it, but it, may, it may, if it looks that way, maybe you're right. <laughs> I'm probably wrong. Um, you mentioned that when you went to school, the word used was clean. Well, you are back at school and have been a, I guess, a faculty or a visiting professor at Harvard for a long while. And you've, in a recent speech, you commented that as a result of that encounter, your vocabulary has expanded considerably. And the words that you refer to are eclecticism, historicism, pluralism, dichotomy, analog, metaphor, syntactic, semiotic, and of course, complexity and contradiction, but no clean. <laughs> what do these terms have in common? How does it all relate to urban development? How does it all relate to the future of architecture? <laughs> Well, the, um, uh, as opposed to uh, all of that, I certainly have a style. <laughs> um, but I, <laughs> the, um, the, the kind of expression that you get in architectural school, I think, and in the, in the wind today, um, is definitely pluralist. Definitely. And you find that uh, both in school and in practice, uh, uh, no compunction against having a building look one way at one end and one way at the other and absolutely uh, uh, graft on some historical element to modern idioms. Um, and so that the, the uh, eclecticism, even within one building, changing styles and so on, is, is not a shocking event. And the, I think that the... Uh, as nearly as I can make out from, t from teaching, um, the, what uh, that is very largely is a reaction against what must seem very, very barren. That is the um, architecture of the, of the uh, modern establishment must seem tired and must seem routine and must seem just plain boring. And I think that uh, in many cases that's true. If you think of something like O'Hare Airport is a good one, which is just a routine, uh, terrible uh, building which waits on the, on the soul, uh, just miles and miles of uh, third generation Mies van der Rohe architecture. 
uh, a young man is not going to be impressed by that and I could continue with all kinds of routine architecture and routine thinking um, the, so that I think that um, both the, the, the as a reaction against that it's not much fun to do what, what I would call systems architecture um, to continue to develop modular architecture and I think that the uh, so first of all, there is kind of a reaction against that, and something else has to be said, and I sympathize with that. Um, and then I think that um, architects, I, I have not been concerned um, with uh, mood or with um, the real feeling of a, of, a, of a site or a space or something like that. And so often a routine system solution to a school or something is just an, imp just an implanted on the site and it's kind of a heartless affair. Um, I found in school students um, thinking a great deal about the exact ambiance of the site and, um, and exactly how you approached a building and exactly um, uh, what it was like in, in moonlight and night and all this, a lot of romantic stuff and um, not too much concern with the functions. So that gateways are, are big in school, uh, gateways and uh, gazebos and uh, 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 sort of uh, focal elements. Besides the art functions that we are familiar with in the Asia House Gallery, there are non-art purposes to the Asia Society, namely diplomatic and trade functions. Please tell us something about the design of the new Asia Society, particularly in terms of its context and location with your you know, highly sensitized awareness and how the site was selected and why you chose that color. <laughs> the site was selected because we looked for two years at a number of sites and none of them were available for one reason or the other and we finally backed into a site which was admittedly too small and uh, but took it because it was a good site but a little bit small for the building so the building is, is has been really tightly corseted to fit on this site. But in terms of uh, some of the earlier things we were talking about, the site is on 70th and Park, and it faces Park, which is one of the great volumes running, that you spoke about, these, these, this uh, great hallway going through New, New York. And um, it seems to me absolutely proper to reinforce the wall of Park Avenue. And so the, the building is very, very strong and, and like a it's as hard as it can be up against the sidewalk line, defining Park Avenue and lining up with all the other Park Avenue buildings. And the building is fairly big, a, a, a equivalent to, an, a, to an, a 10 story apartment building. And it faces little brownstone scale and back on 70. The question is uh, in the design, what you do to accommodate the Park Avenue and also come down to earth and uh, be a good neighbor. This is this context kind of architecture that, that I've been talking about. You never design this building freestanding, but it'd be, be perfectly clear to you when you see it on the site what we're trying to do. The building on the side street su suddenly shrinks back and sets back, and there's a garden in front of it. So that the, um, it, it immediately moves to the back of the lot, and the, and the adjacent house then s sets forward and is free, and, the, and the whole bill, our whole building is kept back uh, and uh, 50 feet away from it at the sidewalk. Uh, and that's a, uh, 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 a good example of this question of uh, paying attention to, to the uh, spaces on both sides. Now, the um, color of the building, uh, there was a brownstone there, uh, old Millican houses, and I but thought it would be... Some people admire it very widely. And so did I, and I thought that it would be nice to at least put the build a building a brownstone. Uh, brownstone is almost a vanished material now. So you can't get brownstone, not enough of it. Uh, and all the quarries have run out. And w I was puzzling about how to get brownstone. We actually tried to, we were looking into importing some from Germany. And um, John Rockefeller, who was the uh, uh, great benefactor of Asian society, said, why don't we get it from India? Why don't we get India's Indian sandstone? And so we, um, uh, Asian society made contact with the Prime Minister and went through all the motions and uh, we immediately started to design the building using uh, Indian sandstone. It's a reddish and color. A reddish color. Now that we'd wanted to mix um, with a polished uh, red granite uh, so that you would have two kinds of reds, uh, a 
polished in a dough and, and then inlay them in the building, sometimes uh, checkerboard them, and sometimes like a, like a Muslim box or something that you just, a flush stone inlaid, inlaid, box. inlaid box. And uh, that's what we're doing with one uh, important difference, and that is that somewhere along the line, the Indian sandstone fell through and uh, we had to shift to two kinds of granite, two kinds of granite finishes, but we're still using a dull pink against a polished red, and, uh, and, and it still looks like an inlaid box, and we are getting enough of the red sandstone for the paving, so there'll be three kinds of stone. And uh, uh, I don't know, you'll have to see, the stone will be going up this summer, what it looks like. You mentioned that you too admire the uh, Millican house. Were there any elements of that house that you have retained and plan to incorporate in your current design? We were, didn't find a way to take uh, chunks of Victorian brownstone and incorporate them in the uh, in the Asia House. I think uh, partly because um, it really would have been confusing. Asia House is uh, the, the gallery is full of Asian art, and I think that if you're going to incorporate anything, it ought to be something from that part of the world. Um, but I think that that, um, in another context, would be a reasonable thing to do if you were building an apartment house or something. I, I thought there was once a plan to uh, incorporate an existing arch as part of the entrance to the garden. There was talk about that. They about go the it. way of the sandstone. That <laughs> went the way. That went the way of the brownstone. Uh, let's talk for a moment about the Klein Building. We have very little time remaining, so if I may, I'm going to give you some of the facts, and please again correct us. The Klein Building is a 36-story skyscraper on the northeast corner of Madison and 54th Street. It's 495 feet high, 420,000 square feet of office space that Mr. Barnes told us he was squishing out, I guess, the last inch of that, 420,000 square feet. The material is a light-colored aluminum that is similar to the silver satin finish of City Corp. And the cost is $59 million, at least as of its last record. There is an 80-foot high arcade with a diagonal pedestrian walkway from 54th Street to a large urban park behind. It is no accident that uh, there is a greenhouse in IBM, that there is a, an urban park behind, that you are the person who recycled the Bronx Conservatory. Because of your long-standing interest in landscape architecture as well, um, can you describe that building to us and what you see as the interrelationship between the design of the IBM building and the Klein building? Are there any elements that were inspired or adapted from the IBM to the Klein? Well, in both cases, we reinforced the retail street line on Madison as, as, as uh, happily. Uh, that the line of shops goes unbroken up and down Madison. In both cases, both cases, the leftover bonus space is put in the mid block, and this, I think, is a. Um, if you want to have something to fight for, is uh, worth concentrating on. That in, in New York City, that the high masses masses be on the avenues, and that the low masses be on the streets. That would give the whole city a grain, like a piece of wood, in which uh, it's absolutely clear the wide streets get the high buildings, it's logical, the narrow streets get the low buildings, you get light into both. And it does give, uh, it, as you cross the city, a kind of a sense of history and scale to go leaping up the big buildings, framing the avenues, and down to a scale low enough to accommodate brownstones. The, the Klein building does that. The park is on the mid-block side and faces two brownstones. And so it'll be, it, all of a sudden, it has to come down to a very small scale with, where there'll be a sort of a Paley Park type garden. I think the other thing I, that we are currently very interested in that building is, um, uh, which I, 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 I don't know whether it has to do with it, what, whether it'll come off or not, but we are playing with um, interesting materials. The aluminum, we're trying to get a gunmetal finish, which would be kind of an ice color, gray, gray with a slight blue. And the glass, which is a very slightly mirrored glass, will have a blue, blue-green cast. We're playing in the, in the garden with a fountain, which we're designing in the office with the help of a brilliant young guy who is a, uh, works for Corning Glass, doing uh, glass sculpture. What's his name? This is a carpenter, Jamie Carpenter. 
and uh, we hope there to have a, have a uh, fountain of uh, uh, glass brick and water. Uh, uh, more ice colors, more uh, uh, water and glass and, and uh, cool colors. Keep um, doing this. I hope it'll have an accumulative effect. Well, you have been energy conscious in all of your construction, particularly in the instance of the IBM building where you make the claim, and justifiably so, that it is a, uh, an energy conservative building. Can you give us some little idea of what assist you had in the design of that building and why you know that your claim is an accurate one? Well, I know it because IBM is absolutely dedicated to this. If the architect was completely goofing off on energy, he would be stra straightened up by IBM. They are computerizing everything. When the heat goes on, when the heat goes off, when the lights go on, when the lights go off, they have most a great deal of uh, wasted energy. How about energy. when the windows open, and which is the major feature of that they're building? Asked, they've asked us to have windows that open. And um, there, there is a difference of opinion between the architect and IBM uh, as to whether that really is going to save energy or is going to be misused and let all the heat go out so that the windows will have locks on them in case that assumption doesn't work. But the thought is on opening windows, and everybody in this room would say, why can't we open windows? And every person on the street says that. The thought is that in the half seasons when you don't need air conditioning or heating, you simply can open windows to get fresh air. Uh, in the case of a big building, it's only the outside 15 feet you're talking about. There are acres of space inside that aren't affected by that. But the, there is the possibility that that gets misused. Which of those two buildings opens first, the Klein or the IBM? Uh, the IBM will top out first, but the Klein will be finished and occupied before, before the IBM is finished. Well, if that is the case, how does that affect, since there is that prism top and other elements that are similar in the two buildings, how will that affect the public perception of either of the two buildings? Um, I hadn't even thought of that. I think that um, the IBM building will be seen as a uh, steel frame uh, first, and this uh, the, this form I'm talking about will be will be up here. And it actually is quite different from the Klein main shaft of the Klein Tower. I think most people will think of them as quite different buildings. One is stone, and one is a high tech. Um, and uh, I do too. I think, except for the, the things I've said are like. Uh, the sighting and so on, they are different. Charles Moore claims that his clients are the starting point for all of his designs, while on the other hand, Kevin Roach says that his best clients tell him nothing at all. Where do you fit in on the scale of all or nothing? I am definitely on Charles Moore's side. I think the, um, the um, if I count the good buildings and the, and the bad buildings that I've done, um, I'd the good buildings usually have someone like Martin Friedman or a, uh, a, a good client. I, I think that the, the relationship between an architect and a, and a uh, client is uh, uh, so much mixed up with the quality of the building, I, get, I can't say. I can't imagine isolating myself from the client and doing a good building. Is there the work of any particular architect that has inspired you or to which you most warmly respond? Well, when I was in school and for long after, uh, I liked, of course, Le Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe, and as a Chicagoan, uh, like Frank Lloyd Wright, those great three uh, pioneers. And I've never been able to uh, come off it quite, but I have almost as high a regard for Lou Kahn. I, I think that uh, given... Uh, uh, his period and what he did and so on, he was a, absolutely a remarkable, remarkable uh, architect. And uh, Do any of his museums or, and the use of light within them yes. affect your work? Yes, I looked very carefully at his uh, Fort Worth Museum, where Kimball. he is the Kimball Art uh, Museum. And I went to see the, so the Salk Center uh, recently. I thought it was absolutely marvelous. And last question. Uh, you are associated with the so-called greys. In fact, you are referred to as their dean rather than the whites, and that is 
uh, with architects like Moore and Venturi who are concerned with context and vernacular or historic association in contrast to the whites. Those architects, like, and we've had some of them as our guests, like the New York Five, who have formal in interests that stem from Corbu. How do you feel about this division into camps? Is that artificial? Well, I think there was a, there is a, there is a connection uh, uh, between the New York Five, um, and I guess it is Le Corbusier when he was white. Uh, there's a whole section of Le Corbusier when he was when he was gray, but uh, uh, <laughs> Corbusier uh, uh, wrote uh, about when the cathedrals were white, which is such a romantic title. And a, a per great period in the 20s when he was white. Um, now has tremendous nostalgia, uh, like Art Deco and a number of things. It's, a, it's very much easier to be romantic about something which is just not next, not next door. And that, that uh, unifies uh, certainly Meyer and Guathme and uh, to certainly Graves and uh, uh, they, they all of them seem to me to be uh, steeped in the romance of that period and I understand it perfectly. Uh, it was a great period. I once I made a tour of Paris trying to see all those old buildings. Thank you, Evie Barnes, for your extraordinarily honest, refreshingly non-polemical, sensitive ideas on the state of architecture today. Thank you very much for being with us, and thank you for coming.